Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another segment of Healthy Hints from Ham. Um, every month we try and do um, the topic of the month, which this month is UV Safety Month. Or some month we just do whatever the hot topic is. So this month, it happens to be both. Um, the news channel that I watch has a segment called Verify. And one of the questions I had that came across was, should African Americans or people of color wear sunscreen? And of course they had their doctors on there answering that question. So should African Americans or people of color wear sunscreen? True or false? Hold that thought. Um, our topic this evening is sunblock, its uses and misconceptions. I am Ella Forney. And my co-host is Linda Canny. Good evening. Hi, Linda. Good evening. Hello, um, Sister Ella. I'm Linda Caney, and I'm a member of the Health Advocacy Ministry at Faith Ministries Church. Just so interested in this topic. As Sister Ella mentioned, uh, I've been seeing a lot on the news just this week about um, UV rays, sunscreen and the impact that it has on uh, the health and the well-being of African Americans and how we need to use sunscreen just like any other uh, group. We're just as susceptible to uh, skin cancer. So really looking forward to some really vital information from Dr. Um, Graham Hicks and uh, well, can't wait to get started. I know you're going to learn a lot. Okay, so she already gave it away who our guest is, but <laughs> Uh, our guest today, a graduate of Spelman College and the School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, served as an intern in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Massachusetts Journey General Hospital in Boston, completed a research fellowship at Harvard's Wellman School of Photo Medicine, completed her dermatology residency at the Los Angeles County Medical Center, board certified Columbus dermatologist, owner of Downtown Dermatology right here in Columbus, creator and founder of Live So, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a premium hair care brand, a member of the American Academy of Dermatology, and a devoted wife and mother of two children. Please welcome Dr. Sherry Hicks Graham. Hi, Dr. Graham. Hello. It's so nice to see you all. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, sunblock, its uses, and misconceptions. So um, I guess we should get started. If you don't have, do you have a presentation, if not, we'll just go right into the questions that we have. Yeah, you know, I want this to be as interactive and interesting to the audience as possible. So I won't, I won't bore you with a canned speech, but I can, I can kind of lead us off if you'd like. One thing I'd like to say before we get started, usually we have our listening audience wait until the end of a presentation to ask questions. This would be a good time for our listening audience to ask your questions right now. If you have a question for Dr. Graham, we can you know, address your question right away. And we'll start out with some questions that we have and you guys just kind of interact with us as we go. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, you know, um, why do we think we don't need sunblock? <laughs> well, you know, that's such an interesting question. Thank, thank you for having me. Um, this is a really important topic because um, in recent years, we have learned so much more about the needs, the specific health needs as it relates to people of color. And one thing that I have really witnessed is that you're right there is a misunderstanding around who needs sunscreen and why and um what we found is that people of color absolutely still need to wear sunscreen and the reason is that the sun's uv rays really don't care on about who they fall on they will fall on all of us and the fact of the matter is that we all can get sunburned and we all may be at risk 
for damage to our skin because of the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. So if you have skin that um, really hasn't seen much sun because you've been in the house in COVID, and then you go out and you spend all day outside and it's 90 degrees and you haven't been out for a while, you will likely get a sunburn, whether you are the deepest ebony color or if you are as light as, you know, perhaps some of our lighter skin members. Um, but the fact is that we are all potentially at risk for damage from the sun's um, ultraviolet light. And so we have to protect using sunscreen. The, at the AAD, American Academy of Dermatology recommends that we all wear at least an SPF 30 or higher um, every day, every day. And that you reapply after you come out of the water. So if you've had, um, if you've gone swimming and you come out and you've had it on initially when you when you left the house, you should probably reapply. Okay, um, you brought up the SPF. That's one of my questions. Um, uh, at least thirty, if you're right, is what I've heard, what I've read when I was doing the uh, research for our uh, session tonight. How do we decide which SPF is best for us? First of all, tell us what SPF is. Yeah, SPF just stands for sun protection factor. And we actually, a lot of us still use the term sunblock, but officially we have, we have moved away from that term and we call it sunscreen because the idea was that a sun, uh, the term sunblock may have given people a sense of artificial security that the product that we're applying is literally blocking the rays. What's well, not really, what it's doing is it's filtering. So any lotion, cream, spray, stick, any formulation that, that has a sun protective factor listed um, simply is either um, absorbing and scattering the sun's rays to help us filter and protect our skin more, or it are we still here yes can you hear me yes, I, I just yeah, heard okay. yes we didn't hear the end of, yes. of your last comment dr Brandon. oh okay i'm sorry about that if i if i was buffering Hopefully that won't happen again, but I'll just repeat that the sunscreen either absorbs and scatters the sun's UV rays so that it won't harm our skin. And that's the kind that is typically like a chemical based sunscreen. If it's mineral, then it's reflecting the sun's rays. And those usually have either titanium dioxide or zinc oxide um, and both forms of sunscreen are effective. It doesn't matter. As long as it's just an SPF 30 or higher, that's the most important thing. It's also important to use enough. So you want to make sure that you use a full ounce, okay, a full, um, really two ounces of sunscreen all over to, to protect the entire body. And you want to reapply it at least every two hours if you're going to be outdoors or after coming out of this the water like if you're swimming to reapply uh linda do you have an opportunity do you want to have a question you'd like to ask yes i wanted to know um is it important to use uh sunscreen um in the winter or well you know other than summer we always often think of only using sunscreen in the summer when we're at the pool or outside but how important is it to use at other times of the year? I think that it's quite important to get in the habit of using it um, really all year round. Clearly, it will be most important when the UV rays are the strongest. So that's the summer, really the period between April and October. That's going to be the most important time. But, you know, naturally, people travel you know, with global warming, you know, nature is changing. And so you can experience some high ultraviolet light exposure days in the winter, particularly if there's snow on the ground, 
that ultraviolet light can bounce off the of snow. And if you happen to be on medications, for example, or if you have medical conditions that make you more sun sensitive, like lupus, autoimmune diseases, or if you're on medications like some um, blood pressure medicines make you sun sensitive, those things can still cause um, damage from ultraviolet light even in the winter months. So it's important to take the guesswork out of it. And I recommend that patients apply sunscreen daily, year round on exposed surfaces of skin. So the face, the backs of the hands, the neck, the V area of the chest, all of those areas are important, more important in the height of the summer. Um, you hear the word melanin a lot when you're talking about dark skin. Um, can you explain to us just what that's all about? Sure. So melanin refers to the pigment that is held within certain cells called melanocytes in the skin. So melanocytes are those pigment containing cells and it, you know, that pigment we term melanin and that melanin is really superpower. I mean, this stuff is awesome. So it literally blocks the sun's ultraviolet rays from causing damage to our DNA. Okay. That's how, that's how tough it is. And it also, um, uh, develop and it can increase. So you can, you can have greater melanin that tries to protect itself from UV damage. So, um, you know, we're all kind of genetically destined to have, you know, the type of melanin, the size of melanocytes, the number of melanocytes that's determined genetically, but we all have the capacity of increasing that to a degree as we get exposed to sun. And that's how we produce a tan. And so, you know, some of us have a natural base tan because we're endowed with more melanin and that protects our skin. And that's where the wonderful phrase black don't crack comes from because that melanin protects us in a way that most people of color don't get a lot of fine and, and deep wrinkles right? Because it, and, and that's just evidence that um, points to the fact that, that, melana, that those melanocytes are helping to keep our skin um, protected from UV damage over time. So that sounds like one of the reasons why African-Americans or people of color think that they don't need sunscreen. That's true. That's true, but it's really not enough. It's not enough because we know, practically speaking, all it takes is, you know, a trip to Jamaica or a trip to the South. And, you know, once you're exposed to sun that's a little bit more intense and you're out for a very long period of time and, you know, you may, you may not necessarily recognize that you're sunburned in the traditional sense because if you're um, brown, you may not be able to see the red quite as easily. But if you know what you're looking for, you can see that the skin may turn a deeper, like a, a more, um, we call it vibrant, like almost like a deeper purpley brown. Um, you can get small bumps that we call sun poisoning. A lot of us grew up with the term, oh, it's just a little sun poisoning. Well, it's actually what we call photodermatitis. You have a sun rash and um, of us determine, develop that over time. So you might think, oh, my eczema just, I always break out in rashes in the sun. It's just, you know, my eczema is flaring. Well, you might actually have uh, um, sun poisoning or what we call polymorphous light eruption from the sun. So our sunburns don't always look the same as our Caucasian counterparts, but the damage can still happen. And it may not cause you to get a lot of wrinkles and that sort of thing, but it can cause hyperpigmentation, which some of us don't care for. As time goes on, we can develop what we call melasma, where you get patches of brown that, or, or just uneven skin tones. A lot of men that wear hat top have this like little clear, but then the sides of their face may be a, a hue that, 
than the rest of our face. And we wonder like, why is my skin not even? Well, your skin may not be even because over time that tan that you accumulate year after year isn't fading, it's just stacking. And so while we may not get fine line goals, what we might get that makes us look older is hyperpigmentation. And we were like, wow, my skin used to be so even and clean when I was young. Now I'm mottled and discolored and why am I not the same color? That's, that's usually what I hear. I'm not the same color on my face, on my shoulders or what have you. Why is it so uneven? And it's because we, we didn't know to protect that melanin so that it wouldn't become uneven. So can the, can the skin um, rejuvenate or repair itself once you've experienced that sunburn or that sun poisoning? Yes, yes. Our body is, is miraculous. Um, we have a way of repairing it time if you you know just like anything else if you keep challenging it challenging it challenging it really the sun the sun um the, or the skin rather is designed to protect the body right and so it doesn't care what it looks like cosmetically because the the nature of the body is to protect itself it's going to keep becoming more and more hyperpigmented where it needs it so if the body sees hey I'm not being protected on this side. I've got to develop more melanin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deepen this pigment here to try and protect her so she doesn't get a skin. You're going to develop a brown patch here that probably will be very hard to fade. And yes, it can repair itself, but if it happens year after year after year, it's not going to be so easy for that to look like it did when you were 20 now that you're 50. You hit on one of my questions when you talked about the discoloration, because now I'm going to talk about myself. I mother my yard a lot, and I was wearing capris, and I, they came about this far from my ankle. Now I've got that dark spot on both sides that I thought was going to fade, like the tan fades over time over over the season. It didn't fade, and I, is that treatable? I mean, can I do something about that? It, it is. I mean, <laughs> yes, there certainly are fade creams that we can recommend or prescribe, but really, and the lower legs, that's such a great point because the lower legs are complicated, right? Like over time, we're standing on our legs all the time. So you've got a lot of things going on. Sometimes, you know, you can have a little swelling if you're on your feet a lot and it's hot. Um, you might have some insect bites that you scratch and then you get hyperpigmentation from that. And then your point about the sun, absolutely. So that's where you know it's important to say, hey, yes, absolutely, wear that sunscreen because it will help keep your skin in more even tone because you just never know, you know, when that skin is going to say, I'm not fading anymore. It's you know, this happens year after year. Um, my my body is is used to this, and I'm just going to keep this tan around. I'm going to keep this. This is our going to be our new color in this area because she always likes to wear those capris and I just want her to be protected. So I'm just going to stay browner, you know, and that, that's literally how the, how the body works. And, um, you know, over, you know, when our, in our teens and twenties, you know, we can kind of have it go back to normal, but you know, develop moles. Um, you may develop, you know, all it takes sometimes is one sunburn, you know, go, you go on a really warm vacation, you get a sunburn and then you notice like, wow, you've got a patch of freckles now that will not go away. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's always room for assessment and likely treatment, but it, it, it may be more difficult. They, you know, just like everything else, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth what? A pound of cure. Um, right. We have a question, a question here from one of the uh, yeah. yeah, should we, should we use our sunscreen before or after makeup application, which, which would be better? Such a great question. Yes, the application layering question is always so important. So um, I recommend that people apply it before makeup application. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated because it depends on what kind of makeup it is. And some makeups have sunscreen in it. But in general, I recommend um, having the sunscreen be the last liquid product that you put on 
right before makeup because you you can imagine that if you have a beautiful finish to a makeup that's like a brown color and you put sunscreen on top it could alter the cosmetic appearance of the makeup that you you know wish and so we recommend just putting it on right before the final makeup and um that should suit your needs the tricky part is if you're wearing makeup and you need to reapply sunscreen throughout the day, what do you do? And so in recent years, they've come out with some powders that have iron oxides in them, and they have a nice tint that can be kind of brushed over the skin. Um, and it, you know, I can get back to anyone interested about some brands, but um, that's possible. And then there are also some creams, decent um, cosmetic finish that you can apply over makeup, but that is a challenge. So we recommend not only wearing sunscreen and relying on the sunscreen if you're wearing makeup, but also having a hat with you so that if you'll be out and you don't want to mess up your makeup and, you know, use a wide brimmed hat and be, be cute that way. And of course, not to forget <laughs> sunglasses too that wrap around to protect your eyes. So you mentioned about the, the, the tent and is the sunscreen that you get that that might be tinted is it just as effective as the you know sunscreen that's not just so it make sure it has the at least the 30 spf yes as long as you you know that number let that number be your guide and um the best that's the best way to make sure that it's it will be sufficient is to just check that the sun protective factor spf number um if it says 30 or higher you should be in good shape um, and if it's a lot of the mineral formulations these days are now tinted and that's great for people of color because typical sunscreens have not fared well cosmetically on skin of color. It gives you this like whitish ghostly look and it looks weird. You look like purple or, or floral, just too, too like pale. It's weird. So, um, you know, these tents, these tints to be more neutral um, for our diverse population now. And, and in many cases, they work well. Um, for the best cosmetic finish, I do for most folks of color, um, you may be happiest with a traditional chemical sunscreen that contains like avobenzone, um, one of the chemical filters, and those are fine. There's a product called Black Girl Sunscreen that's quite nice that goes into the skin looks beautiful and gives a nice um, radiance. So I recommend that a lot. And then if you have more sensitive skin, there are lots of other brands to try. Um, my son took his kids to Florida for a holiday vacation. My one son, grandson, swole up from being in the sun. Now, I can say that's um, sunburn, is that an allergy? Or maybe he swole up from something else, but his mom seemed to think he had too much sun. Can you comment Absolutely. on that? Yeah, I mean, that probably was that polymorphous light eruption. It's hard to say without uh, without hearing, you know, and seeing him directly, so I really don't know. But it, yes. it may likely have been that um, sun poisoning or polymorphous light eruption, um, particularly our patients who have eczema or dry skin sensitivity, um, when you add pools, so you're, you're swimming in the chlorine, you may be swimming in a beach with salt water, all of those things dehydrate our skin. And if you're eczema prone to begin with, then that might kind of cause you to have a broken skin barrier. And then when you throw a lot of all day sun with kids just excited to be outside, on top of that, without adequate sun protection, it can be a prescription for disaster or a trip to a local urgent care. And, um, you know, so really, again, prevention, prevention, prevention. We have to protect our children um, from sunburn because certainly the young ones, um, doesn't matter their hue or age, they can still get sunburn. And then they're itchy and uncomfortable. And great question. So in darker skin, what does a sunburn look like? I was just about to answer that relative to the children, um, but this applies to everyone. So in darker skin can just look 
it looks like a deep red. It just looks like a deep, a deep reddish kind of like a deeper purple tone. Um, it just, yeah, it just looks, it looks sometimes just a reddish undertone. It's really about recognizing the undertone and noticing the difference. So, you know, you know what your own skin looks like, you know what your loved one's skin typically looks like. And if, if it just takes on a slightly shinier hue with maybe few little, little, we call them papules or tiny bumps, around hair follicles usually, or just in sun exposed areas. So typically like the tops of the arms, the backs of the arms are the areas in the car or at, on the beach when you're sitting in a chair, um, the tops of the legs, the cheeks here, the sides of the face, the tips of the ears, the V of the chest. Those are areas that typically um, are, are very sensitive to sun burn if and often the backs of the legs if it's the man if he's not wearing a shirt it could be the chest and back child could be as well on the face usually kids get it right here and sometimes kids with sensitive skin can, they can um, if they're if they're sensitive with eczema their cheeks can actually get like a pale color because the the rim face will um, pigment but then sometimes that sensitive little apple of the of the cheek won't and so it can look like lighter patches and so a lot of people say are they getting vitiligo what's going on here you've got this light patch here well no it's not that they're just sensitive here this skin didn't tan and then the rest got a sunburn so there's this difference so it's important to know what like baseline is for you and with folks of color, it's just about like knowing knowing our skin, knowing your skin, and knowing what's knowing that there's something different. Should, um, should we be looking for different um, sunscreen ingredients or uh, brands for specifically for children? You know, sometimes you see it; it's really marketed towards children. Does that make a difference? You know, it's it's a tricky question. Oftentimes, that's just marketing. Frankly, um, you know, the the key is you. They don't recommend wearing sunscreen or putting sunscreen on children less than six months. Um, so you don't want to do that. And so, really, between six months and two years, you should use a lot of like physical barriers. So clothing, um, shelter with like an awning, hats. Um, making sure that they really wear those little onesie suits and just cover their bodies as much as you can with like sun protective clothing. They have a lot of cute little bathing suits and things like that with UPF. They call it ultraviolet protective factor 50 in them. Those are great for those like little babies. And then certainly between six months and two years, you can um, try and use I, I would recommend the mineral-based sunscreens for them. And you can find some that perhaps use a finer milled um, process so that it blends into skin of color. I find that the ones that are marketed to children though, um, that are mineral typically are very opaque and white. And it's just not gonna look good on a child who's very brown. So I, I, I don't, those for um, our children usually, I usually say, hey, buy the ones that you like to wear and just make sure that they are covered well and just try not to get it in their eyes. That brings me to another point about application. I'm typically not a fan of sprays. Mm -hmm. I don't care for the sprays. And last year, a, there was a big recall on sunscreen sprays that because many of them were found to be tainted with benzene. Not all of them, there was, there was a whole list that came out and certainly not all the ones that were marketed are bad. But what I also don't like about them is that there's often application just misunderstanding. So to wear sprays correctly, you literally have to make the entire body surface like glisten with the liquid that sprayed out and then you have to rub it in to get it on there effectively. Most of us don't really have time or know to do that. So we're just going, psh, psh, you know, and you think you're good. And so again, it leads to this false sense of security. I've seen patients come in with burns in a zigzag pattern from the spray that was applied in the center, but then the rest of the skin got missed. And then sometimes if you're applying it outdoors, the wind blows and it gets shuttled down the beach and it's not really where you expect it to be on yourself. So I find that there are just a lot of like 
application problems with sunscreen sprays. So I don't recommend them. I think it's a lot more sure. It's a sure product if you use um, the lotions or the creams. And do they, do they, do they expi is there expiration on sunscreens or lotions? Yes, so yes. Typically, typically, I recommend um, buying like one bottle for your family or two bottles at a time and then just trying to just use it up because most of the time it, it has about a year, maybe two um to to expire and they certainly do lose their effectiveness and usually you can find a little label on the bottle that tells you when it expires so try not to buy um try to choose products that you'll enjoy using and wearing and then just wear them every day and then usually by the end of the season it's about done so, so that was sunrise. Yeah. yeah yeah so the next question how is sunburn treated this is a great one so um in general it's just comfort measures so what you can do depending it if it's not if you don't have blisters and we're we're hopeful that you know and and we're we're, we're happy that because if you're dealing with a person of color blisters are uncommon but they can happen so you know um the lighter your skin is the more common blistering sunburns can be. And so if they're really bad or if your skin is swollen after a sunburn, um, a, a doctor could give you prednisone, a, you could take aspirin, you can use aloe-based or water-based gels to try and cool and calm the skin, or you could use topical steroids like hydrocortisone and things like that. What you don't wanna do is apply Vaseline or any nut butters to a burned skin surface, even though we feel like buy something that will help soothe and moisturize it. What happens with Vaseline and those of treatment products is that it actually holds in heat. And so when our skin is burned, you need to cool it. You need to use cool compresses, aloe-based gels, things to take down inflammation like hydrocortis or an oral. And if certainly there's any sign of infection, you an antibiotic could be prescribed. But those are the things. You just want to stay away from those thick ointments. Um, skin cancer. Um Skin cancer, are people of color less susceptible to skin cancer? Yes. So people of color are less susceptible to getting skin cancer. We only represent about 1% to 2% of all skin cancers in America. However, um, we are not fully immune from developing skin cancer. Black people, people of color can still get skin cancer. And that's the message. We may not get it at the rates of other ethnic groups. You know, Asians and Hispanics get it about two to somewhere 6%. Um, Caucasians bear most of the burden of this disease. But the, the take home message is that African Americans, people of color, people of African ancestry can get skin cancer. And when we get it, particularly in the realm of melanoma, it is much more deadly. So our five-year survival rates are only at about 71%, whereas those of Caucasians are at about 95% at five years. And so we fare much more poorly um, with a diagnosis of malignant melanoma than other ethnic groups. And I think that's in, it, it's part, in part because we don't think that we can get it. And so we misunderstand that there is nothing such as no risk. We, we are still potentially at risk for getting skin cancer, even if the risk is a little lower because, or a lot lower because of our inherent melanin. And I just kind of brought that up because skin cancer is a result of being in the sun? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. All Most right. of the time. Most of the time, Most but not time. always. Okay. We have another question here. Yes. Hi again. How effective 
are the swimming rash guards for kids and adults. Oh, these are great. I think that swimming rash guards are great. They're quite effective, especially if you get the ones that have UPF or SPF in them. They're wonderful. They can, you know, really help you get out of the, the house fast if you're trying to get kids to swim lessons or if you just need to get to the beach quickly. You know, use that sun guard as your friend. You know, try to get the kids to wear sunscreen, you know, on their bodies first and then slap that thing on and you'll be doubly protected. For those who may not be as well informed, what, what is a rat swimming rash guard? What is that? <laughs> yeah, so there are those, um, they're like usually swimsuit material. Some to be, you know, that bathing suit material. Sometimes you can get like a neoprene one that's a little thicker, like a scuba suit. But most of the time, they are just bathing suit material and they're, they look like t-shirts and they make them for, you know, all genders and they can be short sleeved or long sleeved. They can have like usually like a little um, mock turtleneck look and they, they usually match a little bathing suit or whatever. And it can just um, be quite, quite nice because it helps to protect the body so that like, especially for little boys, their whole chest and back isn't exposed. And for girls, the same thing is true. Is there a different um, sunscreen that you recommend for your face versus your body? Yeah, that's a great question. So, on your body, I typically find that sun is designed to be a bit more not as heavy. It's not as greasy, and so you may not feel like it clogs your pores as much. So you, I, I find that daily I use a sunscreen design for my face, and then for my body, I usually use it thicker. Also, from a practical standpoint, the facial sunscreens usually are more expensive per ounce, and they come in smaller bottles. So I'm not gonna wanna use my special face sunscreen that's all nice, on my leg, you know, save that product for my face. Um, but you can use it if you want. Now, when I go to the beach and I'm trying to be as protected as possible, I use that body sunscreen because I usually can get a higher SPF number in a body sunscreen. And I just put it on my face and I don't care if I'm greasy because I don't care. I just want that protection. <laughs> I don't want to have, I don't want to have um, sun damage. And so, and spots that, that won't leave. I already have a freckle that I, I blame on um, Mexico. Um, but yeah, so. What, what's your view on the spray tans? Spray tans are, are fine. No, no, spray tans, sunless tanner, lotion, all of that is nice. And, you know, some of us have a few little, um, like leg veins that you may find to be apparent that you may want to camouflage a little bit. And I think that's a great way to use a spray tan or sunless tanner. Um, you can find, those are all very safe products. They are not harmful. Use them as much as you wish. But I do recommend that if you apply it, don't view it as a, like a, a sun protector. Okay, it's not going to protect your skin from sunburn. So I still recommend like getting your spray tan and then putting your sunscreen on top when you go out. Uh, this question may not be one for African Americans because I don't think we did, we use the uh, suntan spas. But is it safer to get a suntan in the spa or normally by sunbathing? That's a great question. Um, I've learned here in Ohio not to ever assume because um, in, it's popular in certain towns. Um, and um, so there are people who just want to have a deeper skin tone regardless of ethnicity. And so your question is, is excellent and valid. The, the artificial tanning bed is very unsafe. I would assert that it is, it is less safe than natural sunlight and it is associated with more malignant melanoma than those who frequently are exposed to natural sun. And so I, 
highly discourage the use of artificial tanning sources, otherwise known as tanning beds. They're very bad. It's 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 a known carcinogen. It's listed on you know on the the list of car, of you know carcinogens, things that cause cancer, just like cigarettes. Okay. One other question I have, you know, during the summer, we all seem to get darker. We get a tan. Is a tan a form of sunburn? Just that natural tan that's going to fade over the summer? Yeah, good question. It's not viewed necessarily as sunburn, but it is evidence of sun damage. Yeah. Okay. So a tan, a tan, <laughs> a tan not is, what you wanted to hear. Yeah. I know a tan is evidence of sun damage and it's, it's really pretty. I tell you, it's pretty when you're like a teenager or a 20 year old, but then something happens and you realize that you've gotten too much. That happened to me when I was like, I went somewhere and came back and I thought I looked great. I had gotten way too much sun. This is my pre-derm years. I'd gotten way too much sun thinking I was cool. And um, when I got back and really, you know, got in my home bathroom light, I like my skin was just crinkly and I could, I could appreciate that it was damaged. And I said, oh, because I always got like, for me, my sensitive area was just right here on the, like my heart center, right up here. And, um, you know, I don't know why that is. I think it's just a little bit more elevated and I was good about protecting my face. But, you know, I just didn't pay attention to this area and it got a lot of sun because it's angled up. And that often gets it. Our forehead often gets it. It's just where it's angled to reach those those um, sun's rays. And, you know, all it takes is to really see what your crepey skin looks like after a bad, <laughs> you're after too much sun. And you realize this is not this is not beauty. This is damage. <laughs> yeah, not, real, not really worth it. No. Okay, uh, Linda, because I think I've exhausted uh, all my sleeping. Well, uh, we've talked a lot about sunscreens and sunburns. What about uh, overall preventative care for your skin overall and, and the benefits of, you know, seeing a dermatologist on a, on a regular basis or for a skin checkup? How important is that? Yes, so most adults could use a baseline skin examination if they've never had one. So just to a head to toe survey and make sure that all the lumps and bumps that may have, you know, for forever that you assume are okay, really are. And um, it's also really important to just do that on your own at home. So the American Academy of Dermatology recommends that patients do skin self-examinations at home, just like you would for breast exams. And so really you wanna get comfortable looking at your own skin so that you understand what you have and what's, what's normal for you. And then if you see something that's changing or new, you'll be able to recognize it. And so you literally want to um, just examine yourself after you bathe, just take a look with a mirror in a well-lit room and try to look at your head, you know, your, your scalp, you know, ask your hairstylist or your barber to just check you out and make sure, Hey, if you tell me what that little bump, you know, help, help me, help me wash this. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that hairdressers, stylists, barbers have like brought patients to, or recommended the patient see us because they've noticed something and it's skin cancer. So, you know, mm -hmm. we literally watch our neighbors back. If you see something on a loved one or a friend that looks like it's changing or really um, dark, though, you know, you want to watch out for that. So know yourself and then get checked by a professional, at least at baseline, and then go from there. Um, one other big point I want to mention about the skin self-exam is, you know, what do you look for? What, what, what's, what should I be on, on the lookout for? And so um, really we have a little, a little memory tool called a mnemonic and it's just, it, it's like this. So that you wanna watch out for anything that's new or changing and, and think about the A, B, C, Ds and Es. So asymmetry of a mole, border irregularity, C is color, color variability or a mole that's getting very dark. D, the diameter of the mole getting larger 
or larger, especially than the top of a pencil eraser, which is um, six millimeters. And then E, evolving, a mold that's changing, new, changing, anything that's evolving, um, you wanna get checked. So that's the little memory tool. But um, you know, certainly anything that's bleeding or painful or just new in any way, you wanna get checked out. Okay. Uh, Linda, you have uh, well, I mentioned at the at the beginning uh, um, that there was a lot on the morning shows about you know skin care and sunscreen, and they mentioned that only three percent of dermatologists in the country are are people of color. It didn't specifically say women, but only three percent are dermatologists of color. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on why that is and how that impacts um, our diagnoses sometime in our care and the care for skin cancer and other skin related issues. Oh, yes, this is a really important topic near and dear to my heart. So um, it's true. The numbers don't lie. We're about 13% of the population is African Americans, but we only represent 3% of dermatologists. And um, that disparity can lead to a lot of under diagnosis a lot of under treatment of common yet severe medical disorders, skin disorders, because skin differences matter. Skin, skin conditions look different in various skin tones. And let's face it, black doctors know black people because we're black and we know what our family, know what our loved ones look like. And we are we we are sensitive to those 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 commonalities, those features. And if you just haven't been exposed to people who aren't like you, you just may not know. It may just not. It may not be that you're being intent, you know, harmful to a particular group. That you just haven't been exposed. And unfortunately, this is a systematic issue because at medical school is difficult to get into and dermatology residency is exceedingly difficult to get into. And so you have, you know, it's literally just a, a, a weeding out process. And so if you don't have people who are sensitive to the needs of community members who, you know, are interested in allied health professional um, education, they might not be sharing the information about how to do well on standardized tests, how to get into medical school from the beginning, how to, you know, what do you do? And so it's really important to meet students where they are, you know, really from high school, undergrad, um, the pre-med process, and certainly into medical school and residency to make sure that people are being guided appropriately for success from the beginning. Um, you know, it's complicated. You know, medical school education is expensive. And so a lot of this is, is about access. And it's about, you know, ensuring that we all have a seat at the table. So, um, you know, I try to mentor when I can. If I see a young, young student who, you know, I think poses a lot of potential, then, you know, if, if they're interested in, in shadowing, once they become, um, you know, certainly undergraduate students in health sciences, because many of them need clinical hours, then, you know, oftentimes they can spend some time working in my office with me. Um, they ha it has to be under the, the guidance of a school program just because of, you know, to, you know, liability concerns, and it has to be an official time that's appropriate for their schooling. But I'm, I'm really into that because it can't all stop with me. You have right. to keep the ball rolling and we have to increase the numbers so that we can all get the care that's so desperately needed. Right, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question. Uh, do you have a product recommendation for sensitive skin sun protection? Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, I really like, let's see. There, there are a few. There is a product line by Cetaphil that I think is good. It's called Cetaphil Derma Control, and that's very good. A lot of patients do well with that who consider themselves sensitive, and it's an SPF 30. That's good for the face. Um, and I also really like, gosh, there are, there are a bunch. Um, 
I, but I, I really like that one for face. And then Eucerin just came out with a product line that has a mineral SPF that is very nice and it, it blends in well. And, um, you know, that's, it's, it's in an orange tube or bottle and it's very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one other question, what are the flat skin molds that usually appear on your face as you age? Can you do anything about them? Yes. So like, um, we love him, but yeah, the Morgan Freeman moles, those little things, the little dots. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, those are so common. It's one of the most common, um, benign skin growths in dermatology. And they're very common in people of color, especially African Americans. And, um, yeah, they're just a feature, you know, one of the things that come with natural aging and they're called dermatosis papulosa nigra. We call them DPNs for short. And they are treatable. If they're elevated, we usually treat them most efficiently with a little electric needle, a little electric, electric pen. And we prescribe a numbing cream that can be applied to the skin cosmetically in advance of the procedure. And then we just, you know, take off those moles. You'll, they'll be a little gray and crusty and then they fall off about two weeks, one to two weeks later. And sometimes it requires multiple treatments, but the treatment is very successful and very safe. Is that Ooh, different the than skin tags? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So skin tags are kind of like them, but they are under the microscope, they are distinct, distinctly different. Um, skin tags are just little fleshy parts of skin that decide to kind of bulge out and um, they usually come in pinchy areas. So like under the arms, the sides of the neck um, and other places that just fold. And so um, those, those skin tags can be nuisances, but they're generally harmless. If you do develop lots of them, it might be more comfortable to get them removed because you know over time they can get kind of itchy and sore. And then this is a great question. What are the light spots that appear on your legs as you age? And can you do anything about them? The light spots are also called idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. And they're very common people of color. They usually are a result of sun exposure over time. So they're basically age spots that look white on brown skin, just like on white skin age spots look tan or brown. It's the same thing, just different color. Huh. That was a and good question. The unfortunate... <laughs> oh, what's that? I didn't know to ask that question, but that was a good question because I have mm -hmm. noticed that on myself. And I'm thinking, what is that all about? Should I go to the doctor? Yeah. You know, you think anything that changes, you should, you should go to the doctor. That was a good question. Thank you, and still, And still do... Yes, that was a good one. And still see the doctor about it just to make sure because, um, you know, what, what I say may not be the, quite the same thing that you're referring to, but those common right. spots, that's what they are. Now, um, and unfortunately, those white spots are not treatable. They're, they're really, I mean, it's easier to prevent. Once they're there, we unfortunately don't have anything that brings the color back very well at all. Okay. All right. Um, any final thoughts, Linda or Dr. Graham, before we close? Well, I, I wanted to ask, is there, is there one thing or a couple of things that we didn't ask that you are oftentimes asked when you do presentations that you would want our audience to know? Wow, you all have covered it so nicely. Um, I would just say, again, that you know, sun protection is something that you want to, you want to just make a habit. You want to make it a part of your life and um, something that, that just feels natural. You don't want to, you know, it doesn't have to be a big deal and it doesn't have to take a long time, but you do want to make it just part of your daily routine. And so just like brushing your teeth every day or putting on lotion, like people put lotion on their body anyway. So you might as well in the summer, if you're going to be out going to the park or somewhere where you'll be out in the sun, you might as well use something that's going to also protect, give you that protective um, element to keep your skin healthy and even over time and help reduce your chances of developing skin cancer. Even though as an African-American, the risk is lower 
you are not immune. And so you just don't want to do anything that can tip the odds um, and make it worse, make, make the, the um, chances of you developing a problem worse. And um, so also wear sunscreen every day on the face. There are some lovely formulations that you can get, and this is for men and women on the face. So, so just make it part of your daily routine. It'll not be a big deal and encourage your kids to do the same. Wonderful. So when we first Thank started, you. when we first started, the question was, should dark skin, do dark skin people need sunblock? True or false? False. True. We do need sunblock. <laughs> <laughs> dark skin people don't need sunscreen. True or false? False. Okay. False. So we got that question answered. I've truly enjoyed this segment. It's great. I've, I've, learned, I've learned a lot. Yes, yes. I thank you, Dr. Graham, for being our guest this evening. I know you're a very busy person. Uh, thank you, Linda, for co-hosting. And Absolutely. thank you thank to our you. audience for the questions. And be sure to join us next month. Our topic will be sickle cell anemia. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, ladies. This was great. Thank you. You're awesome, thank you. awesome interviewers. <laughs> thank you <laughs> for sharing your expertise. We appreciate it. Good night. Good night.